Right, co-branding. Extremely important strategy. Um, it consists in effective mutually associated transfers between two or more brands that are going to take a joint branding activity. It may be on a product or promotional development level. Um, uh, it leverages complementary brand associations by enriching each partner with new brand associations uh, while spreading development costs between brands. So it's all about spreading the risk of failure between more than one players. And of course, it's an opportunity for entering new segments and geographical markets. Uh, the digital branding equivalent is affiliate marketing, uh, but it shouldn't be confused and perhaps you should bear this in mind at this stage because we'll be discussing about sponsorship, product placement, and endorsement advertising uh, in our IMC uh, part, which are very important strategies for communications. And, uh, I mean, a very nice case study in terms of the co-branding co um, stems from uh, the smoothie brand Innocent and its uh, partnership with McDonald's. What happened in the case of Innocent? First of all, we have two conflicting positions. Innocent, when it was officially uh, first launched and up until the very end before its uh, takeover by Coca-Cola, uh, it was positioned as the first 100% the first 100 natural smoothie Freshly made from fresh fruit, no concentrates whatsoever. And this was sold as a, in traditional retail outlets. And it also took in ethical marketing positioning. 10% of its profits was given to charities. Uh, McDonald's, on the other hand, although it's a very well trusted uh, uh, fast food chain by its clientele, uh, it is perceived, uh, especially among non users, as not particularly uh, healthy, and this has always been, let's say, a perceptual barrier for the brand in terms of um, extending its franchise and penetrating more segments. The fact that it's invested with uh, negative associations when it comes to healthiness. Now, how do these two seemingly uh, conflicting brands uh, partner in a co branding? Um, Endeavor. Now, the initiative was to include the innocent smoothies, uh, three variants strawberries, blackberries, and raspberries, in McDonald's Happy Meals, which target children. The promotion, the, the co branding uh, initiative, started uh, around between 2007 and 2015, so uh, it did last for quite a while, it was an instant failure. Uh, and the reason why Innocent undertook this. Um, a co branding initiative was that it found in uh, the research that conducted prior to the energy agreement that 72% of these regular drinkers actively want innocent to be sold in McDonald's. They didn't just uh, say they were in mind that is, the non rejectors, they actively um, recommended that innocent should be sold in McDonald's. Uh, precisely uh, perhaps uh, because the core clientele of Innocent might be more prone to order a happy meal from McDonald's if they knew that it was offered along with their favorite smoothie. So, uh, Innocent proceeded uh, with, this, with this initiative, and uh, in this case, we have a dual simultaneous brand association transfer from Innocent to McDonald's health, naturalness, freshness, and transparency, and from McDonald's to Innocent. Brand strength, increase our availability, given that uh, Innocent will be sold at more uh, distribution points in new occasions other than the traditional retail environment. Now, the perceptual risk is that Innocent's of course position was at all to McDonald's, but even more importantly, and th that was the crux and the main point why everything went astray, McDonald's core clientele did not value Innocent's position to such an extent as to justify a price for new rather than a more standard offer. So it's not a case that it was 
uh, perceived as a mismatch, but that they charge premium for this uh, for this offer in the high milk, which of course alienated some of the more value oriented and value conscious consumers among the others. Um, so, in a nutshell, Innocent was perceived as a standalone drink rather than a meal accompaniment. Uh, the um, availability in happy meals did not manage to combat this intimidated perception, resulting in being sold to Coca Cola in 2017. Another interesting co branding um, initiative between Nike and Ivo, they launched the Nike plus Ivo Sported. So, in this case, what kind of stations do you think were transferred from this brand to the other and why? Uh, the Nike iPod Sport Kit. To Nike, the technology to track uh, your, uh, your run, your, uh, your mm -hmm. walk, anything, and as well uh, to to Apple, the adaptability to different uh, markets and segments like uh, athletics and uh, maybe why other markets. Very correct. Uh, another cooperative initiative, uh, Hermes, a brand that is founded with traditional heritage, a luxury brand as well, uh, partnered with Apple and uh, created the uh, Hermes, uh, the Hermes Apple uh, watch. Uh, again, in this case, we have a transfer from uh, uh, Apple to Hermes with the associations of freshness and modernity, and from uh, uh, Hermes to Apple, the associations of luxury and premiumness. Well, also um, having the opportunity to extend its relevance to an upscale segment. So these are win-win cooperative initiatives. Licensing. Uh, licensing essentially consists of contractual arrangements whereby firms can use the names, logos, characters, and so forth of other brands to market their own brands for a fixed fee. So in a sense, the licensing is ranking another brand to contribute to the brand equity of its own product. Um, Advantages, it, um, you can leverage equity that you don't have, exactly uh, more or less the same uh, advantages and disadvantages as co-branding. Here you can see some typical examples of brands which regularly pursue the license out outlet. Harry Potter, The Smallness, Spider-Man, Garfield, Sesame Street, Star Wars, Simpsons, Disney, of course, there's always a downside that this is, uh, um, let's say, a territory where licensing is differentiated from co-branding. Um, there, there is co-branding with dilution. There is, the more categories you license your main characters to, the more you risk diluting your core equity uh, in, uh, for clients who are consumers of both brands separately. This happened with Disney, for example, quite some time ago. It had extended its licensing agreements to such a broad uh, range of categories and occasions for licensing that, it, you know, uh, it had to rationalize it because some of them was, were completely surrounded with the core positioning and the, the core mission uh, and what its character represented. It's, it is the number one company, licensee company right yes. now because the only product they own is uh, if I'm, I'm wrong, correct me, the, the movies. Everything, everything is, is licensing. It's a major part of living, so mm -hmm. I guess it's big. Uh, Rebranding, uh, changing your branding uh, in not necessarily across the board, there are different um, strategies to effect a rebranding initiative. The first one is called Pays In, Pays Out. This is where a new brand that is tied up with the old brand name for a specific period of time. When Disney, for example, opened up in Paris, it was initially called Euro Disney before changing the name to Disneyland Paris. 
The second rebranding strategy uh, is a combination of different brands under one umbrella brand. Uh, again, this is the brand house approach we we're talking about in our brand architecture. For example, the National Bank of America branded its products under 22 different names before changing the model to Visa. And finally, retro branding, retro advertising, nostalgia marketing, like we saw earlier, that is rebranding by capitalizing on brand heritage as a key source of brand equity, the examples of Hobbes and Sainsbury's. Um, there's also a key distinction between tactical and strategic rebranding. Uh, the main difference is that tactical rebranding does not affect a core positioning, so you don't reposition the brand. Uh, perhaps you, uh, you're changing labels or other minor tweaks as you pass brand aesthetics mainly. But when you're undertaking a strategic rebranding initiative, it's always coupled with the repositioning and the same investment in marketing communications, and uh, there is uh, a long, a mid long term equity impact. Uh, and of course, uh, this is where loyalty erosion uh, and declining sales should be foreseen in the event of an alienating a professional franchise. Now, this is one of the greatest rebranding uh, case studies of the past 30 years. Uh, the rebranding of Old Spice. Uh, it took place in 2010 and it has been, uh, it's, it's continued for a decade. It was um, awarded in 2020 by Advertiser Gage, which is uh, one of the key uh, global publications for advertising practitioners as the uh, best rebranding case of the decade. And we'll see why. Let's play the music first. And another commercial with uh, Brooks, two of three Brooks. The extensive uh, new advertising campaigns that are designed for this rebranding was coupled with uh, repackaging. This is why new packaging, especially for major launches, is very important in line with uh, new advertising. Uh, this is why I insisted that you try and develop both your assignments, looking both at packaging and advertising. Now, what happened with Old Spice? Um, it revitalized its packaging and used regular advertising communications that were replete with fans, neurologists, and as you can gather from these television commercials, surrealistic material. What were the marketing objectives? First of all, um, Old Spice had been experiencing for quite some time declining sales and market share, which was mainly lost to the more modern dark man. Uh, in the body care category. They want to revitalize the brand that was perceived as being old and had lost touch, uh, especially with a younger demographic. The main target group was uh, primary target group, men 18 to 34 years old, uh, single or in a relationship. And secondary, female companions of the male targets. 
So the first, the primary group is the actual users, but the secondary group, there were there are major influencers. So it's actually both. Um, now the use of charges is a flagship category for the refining initiative and engaging advertising. Uh, what they did for the first time is that they built unique associations by, not, by targeting women as the primary group in their communication. That is, although the primary group product-wise is men, in the communication is women. This is why the, uh, the commercial voice uh, introduced by Hello Ladies, Who Do Like a Man, is speaking directly to men's female companions. So though the primary target is men, 1834 as purchasers, the receivers of uh, Mustafa Sal Monolog, the athlete uh, in the first CDC, was exclusive women. It was the first time that Brand, uh, the other Brand, was targeted, um, targeted influencers, uh, therefore it capitalized on heterosexual cultural relationships for justifying the relevance and salience of the new spies. They capitalized on the social uh, relationship, on the interaction, on the interplay between genders, rather than talking either to men or women separately. Uh, and this exactly territory allowed it to uh, yield unique associations with the brand, something that was never tried before. As we've already said, unique associations must also be favorable. Lack of, how do you build lack of building? In this case, they used industrial advertising within a kind of athlete as I am as the main actor of the initial brand phase. And in the second phase, a series of parts featuring after Terry Cruz. Uh, so the uh, transfer from Mustafa as a persona to the brand, humor, sophistication, and manliness, and from uh, Terry Cruz to the brand, sophistication, is a very sophisticated actor. Uh, in general, he's a very well cultivated person, apart from his acting career, Terry Cruz, humor, and strength. Um, and of course, it's not by accident that this one, uh, one, one more campaign that has been endowed with great longevity, just like the mother campaign for Procter & Gamble we looked at uh, a couple of weeks ago, or the Things Better With Coke series of uh, jingles that we looked at uh, earlier, uh, the 60s, uh, the draft of the 60s. Uh, that was a very important, still is a uh, very important campaign, which continues by including uh, uh, Isaiah Musaba's son in the new uh, generation of TVCs. So you can see the continuity, and um, as regards the platform they're using, uh, but also the diversity within this continuity. Mm. This is why, for, me, for attaining equity long term, as we said, coherence, brand elements, consistency, brand communications, but not repetition. The same goes with MPD. And what elements you retain, what elements you choose for innovating. Right. How about Facebook's branding in America? And this is a question for Everyone, uh, please feel free to participate, our friends online. Uh, as you may be aware, Facebook rebranded uh, recently into Meta after a long period of deliberation. What do you think about this rebranding initiative? Is this a wise move? Might it be a potential uh, backlash for the company? Well, what Meta is, what it represents, is the next phase in evolution of communications in general in a more augmented reality territory. And is, uh, Facebook is strategically investing in this territory. So it's like being what I was saying earlier about attaining the first moral advantage. 
they want to enter this the general associations about being thinking forward and about bringing tomorrow's technology today as a main platform uh, whereupon all the rest social media will be edified and they call this meta now this came at least um, let's say a very um, uh, considerable um, turmoil about Facebook uh, in the face of scandals about data leakage and about control by agency, uh, uh, government agencies. Uh, this had a major negative impact on the brand. So some thought that this is perhaps Facebook way out of this, let's say, adverse perceptual environment by the brand even the meta. However, what it did is that the not change uh, contrary to the initial proclamations, Facebook to Meta, they played Meta as a corporate brand name under which, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a house of brands fashion, they accommodate Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and so forth. Um, so, at the end of the day, it's not a completing endeavor, although it does attempt to, let's say, move attention from some of the vagaries with which Facebook had been played uh, in the recent past by concentrating on this major rebranding initiative. Right, moving on to pricing. Uh, pricing.